Kenya is preparing to vote in elections which could change the course of African history. President Barack Obama says it will be a major milestone if Kenyans reject tribal divisions and violence and constitutional reforms promise a new type of politics here. But I was in Kenya the last time it went to the polls. I witnessed the violence and devastation which followed the disputed result and saw the country plunged into weeks of chaos. Five years on, families are still torn apart by that violence. Anthony in America still being treated for the terrible burns he suffered back in 2008. His dad still forced to stay in Kenya. And there are thousands like them still hoping for justice after they lost so much. At this time, the stakes are even higher, with one presidential candidate and his running mate facing charges at the International Criminal Court. Are Kenyans prepared to forgive and forget before the trial has even begun? campaigning Kenyan style. This time there's more to fight for than ever before. And the world is keeping a close eye on what happens here. It's a story about dynasty, destiny and power. Two sons from Kenya's most prominent political families vying to become the next president. Raila Odinga from the Luo tribe, a man who feels he was robbed at the job last time round. And his rival Uhuru Kenyatta from the Kikuyu community and the son of Kenya's first independence leader. Right now it's an election that's too close to call. And it's almost as if the violence from five years ago has been forgotten. Politicians come and go, scouring the country for votes, but they leave behind a hunger for justice. This is what it looks like when tribal rivalries are used for crude political gain. The legacy lingers longer than the bloodstains. This was the moment when Kenya crossed a line 1,300 people killed, half a million made homeless following disputed election results. Attacks and counterattacks fueling the violence. And Anthony will never forget. He lives in the United States now, getting the medical treatment he needs. He was only 10 years old at the last election. Just a child, he was targeted because he's from the Kikuyu community. <laughs> Packed with women and children seeking sanctuary, it was set alight by an angry mob. I've been following Anthony for the past five years, watching the boy who adores his sport slowly recover from terrible burns his parents at his side. What do you do? Play. You play? Yeah. And you play with your friends here? Yeah. Football. Football? Yes. You play football in the hospital? Yes. Outside? It's very... Who is your favourite football team? Do you have a favourite football team? Manchester. Manchester. Manchester United? Yes. Well, man, my English is bad. <laughs> I was young then, and I didn't really understand everything that was going on, so I was not the mad or sad, but things were hard, yeah. I found him, and I couldn't believe. In fact, he's the one who knew me. He looked at me and asked, call me, Daddy, I'm here. So I, was, I felt so bad. Well, I didn't feel a lot of pain because I couldn't feel myself, really. I remember drinking a lot of water, and well, I stayed for three months in the hospital, and then... 
Well, they, we had to move to another hospital, so it was seven months, so yeah. I stayed with Anthony throughout the night, and the doctor told me he's, uh, you have to keep close to him because the loss of water is not good for his life. And uh, to date, I believe that uh, being with him throughout that night helped him to stay alive. New Year's Day and the charred ashes of a church set the tone for the weeks ahead. Anthony, his brother and sister, trapped inside. When I arrived, they were still collecting bodies. This place had been packed with women and children at the time, nearly all of them Kikuyu, the president's tribe. They'd fled here to seek refuge from angry mobs outside, men seeking revenge for what they saw as a stolen election. This is a scene of utter devastation. Over here is the door, the entranceway, which was initially barred. The attackers coming in with huge mattresses that they dragged in. They put paraffin them on here and then they set them alight. More than 30 people died that day in what became a shrine to impunity. Witnesses say it was part of a cold, calculated plan and there would be more to come. In the weeks that followed, ethnic tensions escalated. They were whipped up, exploited, and played out on Kenyan streets. Violence was unleashed on an unprecedented scale as tribe became the language of hate. There's so much happening in the country uh, from people being shot by police, uh, neighbors killing neighbors, looting, burning of houses, it was so bad. So on this particular occasion, when they reached the driver, they realized he came from the rival community, quote unquote. So they removed him from the car and then they hacked him to death. Boniface Mwangi, a Kenyan photojournalist, captured it all frame by frame. This was actually happening almost every other day. His intimate observations still imprinted on his mind. They started haunting me. I could hear the screams. I could smell the violence. And so my newly married wife was <laughs> uh, the victim of my, my emotional imbalance because I was very, I was neither here nor there. Like Boniface, people across Kenya were staggered by what was unfolding. But worse was to come. A massive counterattack, allegedly planned by senior figures in government, revenge for the church massacre, which Anthony survived. This is a place famed for its flower farms and its tourist attractions, yet the reality is that Navasha really is a crime scene. It's incredible to recall how these very streets were turned into battlegrounds, how men with machetes sharpening them on the grounds plucked their victims from minibus taxis. It was the 27th of January, we'd woken up, it was on a Sunday, and we'd woken up to go to church. Only to be told that Mungiki, members of the Mungiki sect, had surrounded Naivasha entirely. Bernard Ndege, a fisherman and a member of the Lua community, had lived in Naivasha for years, side by side with his Kikuyu neighbours. When revenge came to town, his family was an easy target. All hell broke loose. They outnumbered us and they attacked us. It was happening everywhere in Naivasha. 
He's returning for the first time since early 2008. Even now, there's a sense of edginess as we pass armed police on the street. And for Bernard, it's an image that revives memories of the past. The streets were abuzz with Mungiki, who were wielding machetes. They were using street urchins who were based in Naivasha, who could easily identify members of the specific communities. There was only one language, kill, kill. And they descend on you with machetes and other crude weapons, killing you instantly. The family and friends crowded into this compound, safety in numbers. Five years on, there are new families with new lives. But for Bernard, this place will be forever haunted. I lost everything. Not even a pair of my shoes. I lost everything. What I came out with was only the breath of my life. Behind the blue door of house number six, 19 people were huddled together. The gang outside locked them in, poured on petrol and set the place on fire. 11 members of Bernard's family were killed that day, all nine of his children. The horror of Kenya's darkest hours may have faded with time, but Bernard in Navasha and Anthony, still in the United States, are yet to see justice. Their cases, central to the evidence to be presented at The Hague, a landmark trial which puts two prominent politicians in the dock. Uhuru Kenyatta, one of Kenya's richest men, is vying to become the next president. He's accused of helping to mastermind the attacks which Bernard's family were caught up in. His running mate, William Ruto, wants the job of deputy, yet he's alleged to have been involved in violence against the Kikuyu, Anthony's tribe. Crimes against humanity, charges that both men deny. Are you going to be an absolute vice president? Last time, their own ethnic groups were killing each other. Yet ironically, these two political heavyweights are now back together, united for the sake of peace, they say. Both are due to stand trial at The Hague, just one month after Kenyans go to the polls. They have a great need to be together right now. There is a trial beginning on April 10th for one of them and April 11th for the other, for which their candidacy, it must be said, appears to be um, the, a, a, last, a last gasp measure to, to stave off um, trial and prosecution. Is it in the best interest of Kenya to continue fighting for the presidency? Of course it's in the best interest of Kenya. That's what democracy is all about, allowing the will of the people to rule. Wouldn't it be better to clear your name first? The process is going on. The poor are not interlinked in any way whatsoever. Away from the campaign trail, silent evidence is fighting to be heard. It includes extraordinary claims still to be tested in court that plans to unleash violence in towns like Navasha were hatched at the office of the president, State House, using the criminal gang, the Mungiki. Five years ago, we gathered evidence and reported on those secret meetings. Now, many of the foot soldiers who it's claimed were hired by the government to do its dirty work have simply disappeared. At a secret location, I've come to meet the widow of one man who was accused of being involved in those murderous attacks. 
One day I came, I saw him washing guns and I was not used to see those things in my house. I used to ask him, what is going on? He asked me, you just shut up. Minor Diambu was second in command of the Mungiki gang. He was allegedly invited to state house and his men hired to kill people perceived as enemies of the Kikuyu in a carefully calculated act of revenge. Those meetings now form a key part of the prosecution case at the ICC trial. You know, he can't tell you, I've killed, I've killed, you know, something like that. He will tell you, I've done something that is tormenting my mind, so don't ask me because you are making me crazy with all your questions and I'm going crazy. So I start sensing there is something going on. And if I start asking questions again, next I will be dead. So I just zip my mouth. Yeah. Jane's husband then vanished. A potentially important lead, seemingly silenced. What do you tell the children who haven't seen their father? I have no grave to show them, to tell them this is the grave of your daddy. So I just tell them he went to abroad. It's a familiar pattern. Scores of men, human rights activists among them, who knew too much and now presumed dead. And other ICC witnesses from all sides are terrified. Definitely there is an attempt to interfere with the witnesses. I have to admit, it's quite a challenge. Has it been more of a challenge in Kenya than anywhere else? It has been quite a challenge in Kenya. We know that there are uh, elements who are actively working to find out who our witnesses are. I think this is very irresponsible because I believe that those who tell us their stories deserve to be protected. Kenya's new reformist chief justice said he'd done all he could to cooperate with the court. You know, they did complain uh, about uh, problems getting to talk to some security people in the government and uh, my advice was that they have you know to talk to the government they talk to the attorney general uh, um, because the judiciary uh, couldn't help in you know in that direction the implication is that it's kenyan politicians not judges who are stalling the process the government strongly denies any allegations of foot dragging. It says it's received 36 requests from the International Criminal Court, most of which have been executed. But it admits some of these have not been processed, either because it's illegal under Kenyan law to disclose certain facts, or because the ICC wants information that is not in the government's possession. Back on the campaign trail, the ICC case is dominating this election. But this is also a test of the judicial reforms the Chief Justice has been pushing through. Ryla Odinga is running again. That worries some Kenyans. His supporters took to the streets in violent protest last time when he didn't get the top job. So what's in store now? We're talking peace, peace, peace. This is the message that we are sending out to all our people. If you do not win, though, will you challenge it through the courts and make sure that your people don't challenge it on the streets? Yeah, you know, the reason why we did not go to court last time was because we did not have confidence in the judiciary of that time. But since that time, a lot of reforms have been carried out. We now have a judiciary that we can live with. And, and therefore, if um, in the unlikely event that we, we lose, we'll definitely uh, go to court. But the bad old ways of doing politics still appear to be the same. Just a few months back, a local dispute in southeast Kenya turned into a bloody massacre. It looked like a deliberate attempt by politicians to stir up ethnic tensions. And even recent party nominations ended in chaos in some historically volatile areas. It makes you wonder what will happen come election day?
This is the junction where different communities meet and if there are clashes, this is where it will happen. There's already been sporadic fighting in the past few days in response to botched party primaries. You can see some of the scorch marks on the pavement here. And it leaves a kind of unsettling feeling that in spite of everything, politicians are still prepared to settle their disputes out here on the streets. So some business owners are taking no chances. Agnes's hairdressing shop was destroyed last time around. This time, she has a plan. As it comes to February 28th, I'll have to remove everything from this premise. I'll come back when we have a new president sitting. Five years on from that brutal church attack, and Anthony has new neighbors in a place where he feels safe. He now lives in the US with his mother. Mom is really caring, and she helps me a lot during difficult times, and most of the times now, because I got her, yeah. <laughs> Oh, okay, okay. You've got to to hear what older people tell you because you know young people learn from the older people. Uh, you may tend to forget about uh, the environment here at home. But Anthony's father has been forced to stay behind in Kenya, relying on technology to keep a keen eye on his son. <laughs> So this will just make sure that we don't accidentally give you any medicines you're allergic to. It's now been several years since Anthony was brought to the US for specialist care. He's been in and out of hospital so much, he's lost count of how many operations he's had. But he seems unfazed by it all. <laughs> how about uh, glasses or contacts? Hearing aids. Hearing aids? Oh, yeah. Oh, OK. All right, take care. OK, you too. Today, Anthony is being admitted for more surgery. His father waits nervously in Kenya. Oh, I wish it was me. I always wish it was me who was banned in that church, and not Anthony. Whenever he goes for the operation and he comes out, he makes a call to me. I can't sleep that night. I feel very bad. Anthony's asked us not to film him beyond this point. He's naturally sensitive about his appearance and the scars beneath his hat as something he wants to remain private. He knows he faces many more years of surgery, a constant reminder of the violence that he and many others faced, violence which is now being defined in stark terms as a crime against humanity. So currently this is my new home. This is where I'm I want to settle my family. Back in Kenya, it feels like another world. Anthony's father is still trying to make sense of it all. He's uprooted to a new neighborhood and is busy building a home with room for everyone, including Anthony. Yeah, I have three bedrooms. One is for the boys, one for the girl, and the main master bedroom for, for, for me and my wife. But the political campaigning reminds him of the past and all that he's lost. And not a single person has yet been held to account. For these two fathers, Bernard and Peter, that's a message that resonates strongly. Very very good. Nice to meet you. Until now, strangers they asked to be introduced, two men on either side of the tribal divide who define themselves in one word, Kenyans. I don't contemplate revenge. The Bible condemns revenge. And even if I were to know who'd done this to me, I think I'd forgive him. I'll leave the rest to Almighty God. I really ask Kenyans to maintain peace that uh, they should not think that it can only happen to other people. It can happen to anyone. We have suffered in silence with very little from 
the authorities in Kenya and the follow up is not there and I it's I mean <laughs> can't talk more Many Kenyans are nervous about the coming weeks. The long shadow cast by the last elections is still present. So can they forgive the past, embrace justice and forge a new future when so many uncertainties remain?